Hey everybody, welcome to the Good Evening Kitties podcast, a Tales from the Crypt review. My name is Melissa, your ghostess with the mostess, and today's episode is season four, episode 13, Werewolf Concerto. Today I have a new guest host here with me, basically my brother by proxy, but also the brother of Mike. Stephen, hi Stephen. Hello Melissa. <laughs> hi everyone. <laughs> Thank you for being on here today. You're welcome. So, what is your history a little bit with Tales from the Crypt, Stephen? Oh boy, well that's uh, that's that's a little sorted. I I watched a lot of the uh, well, I've seen a lot of season one. I think uh, it's a little sketchy on there. I've seen a smattering of episodes here and there. Like I really like uh, Sin Deep. I really like uh, Yellow. Mm-hmm. Nothing, nothing too like. I wouldn't say I'm a long time fan, partially because uh, basically my family had a problem with like me watching Tales from the Crypt when I was yeah. growing up. Bit of a funny story with my mom throwing away, like, the DVD she bought from, like, I think it was, like, a Dollar General or something. It was a really good price on those DVDs. That was recently. That was within, like, the last 10 years. That was within the, uh, yeah, I think I was, like, uh, <laughs> 18 or 19. I'm 27 now, so. Yeah. Because I remember, because we had to rebuy them all. We were going to yeah. take them with it, us. It, it's so weird. <laughs> I think Mike said that he was, like, digging through the trash looking for them. <laughs> yeah, he probably. couldn't find them. So, like, I'm imagining, like, mom sent, opening up a portal in her room and handing them directly to John Kassir as he, like, you know, swallows them whole or something. He would probably give them back. He would find us and give it to him. Yeah, he, he's a nice sort. He would he would give it to people. No uh, mail order necessary. And if you guys have been hearing any meows, that's Gus. Gus decided to come grace us with his presence. Hi, Gus. Are you an undead malefactor? Oh, yes, you are. He's been in a couple episodes where he'll just randomly give his opinion. So if you can be quiet, you can hang out here. So you sit down and be good. So yeah, that's great. Yeah, season one, a lot of people are familiar with. There's only six episodes in the first season anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, a lot of people are only familiar with that. And they kind of... Like, I'm heading into season five soon, and it's kind of tapering off. Like, there's some really good episodes on season five. I'm sure I'll find redeeming qualities, but it does kind of fall apart a little. Right. And season seven's um, all British, like, British actors mm-hmm. and things, so. There, there are a lot of, uh, there are several, uh, well, there's one very big British actor in this episode. There is, yes. We'll get into that here. Okay, so this episode, as always, John Kassir does the voice of the Crib Keeper, and Danny Elfman does the theme song. This episode was directed by Steve Perry, who also directed Parker Kane, which is a TV movie. Uh, the screenplay is by Scott Nimmerfro. This stars Timothy Dalton from movies like Hot Fuzz and TV's Penny Dreadful. Then I also left out, as Mike let me know when I watched this with him, uh, the James Bond the, uh, stuff. He was in two, well, his, uh, he's most known for like Living Daylights and License to Kill, which I consider to be the best James Bond movie of the 80s. <laughs> but I mean, admittedly, there's not. That's a somewhat of a low bar. But Dalton is great. You can say what you will about those movies, but uh, no, I mean, he's definitely he's fun yeah. in Hot Fuzz. I know oh, that, absolutely. So. He has he has like this. You see it in this episode. Like he's got like this, this this wonderfully uh, evil charisma that he just exudes from every pore. It's great. <laughs> this also has Dennis Farina from TV's Law and Order, Walter Gottel from A, a View to Kill. Charles Flesher, for, uh, who is the voice of Roger Rabbit. Yeah, and Benny the Cab in that movie, actually. Uh, he's, I think he's like a... Doesn't like, he, do, he does multiple... Does yeah, he does movie. multiple voices. Benny the Cab's in Roger Rabbit. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't seen that movie in forever. It's, uh, it's a real good movie. It's something. It's something. <laughs> uh, Reginald Vell Johnson from TV's Family Matters, as well as... And as well as uh, Al Powell from, I think his name is Al, uh, from uh, the Die Hard movies, yes. the first two. Yes, he's uh, Which actually, um, I'm pretty sure that uh, Steve Perry, Steve Perry was co-producer on Die Hard 2, so that might be why he got this role in this episode. Oh yeah, it could it's a be. minor role. Yeah. And Lila Rochon, Rochon, from TV's The Division, and Beverly D'Angelo who was flipping Ellen Griswold, which I, I don't know if you've seen a lot of the vacation movies or whatever. I think I've seen one or two. It's funny because, you know, again, mom was the kind of person who'd throw out, you know, Tales from the Crypt, but I'm watching like some of these uh, movies like that. I think it was like that National Lampoon movie where he eats the yak testicles. I forget that one. Hmm. It's like, so watching all this crude stuff. Yeah, some of the Lampoon like, ones are different, but like these, 
these like i watched a lot of these you know you get like uh the christmas vacation then you got like mm-hmm. european vacation vegas vacation and i always really like beverly d'angelo she looks fabulous in this episode as she always oh, yeah, does absolutely and even in the vacation movies i always found that like she is way too good for chevy chase's character <laughs> like Oh, that's, that's, you know, you play like the, you have the male protagonist of those uh, movies who's kind of the butt of a lot of jokes. Yeah. His family is usually too good for him. So. And I mean, they're cute together in it, but it's just like, honey, she, he's bringing you down. But yeah, so she's in this and she's got a, a pretty big role in this. And this episode aired September 9th, 1992. And then I'll read here the info on the back of the box. You'll howl. A werewolf stalks the grounds of a resort hotel, but he's not the only creature on the prowl. That, that is, uh... That is that is spoilers. Oh yeah, sometimes they do. Like, I mean, it, it's kind of uh, there are a few things that are kind of obvious that we'll get into. Yeah, but, but yeah, sometimes they will. Sometimes it tells you nothing, but then sometimes you're like, well, thanks for putting the picture. You already know what happened. This is about legacy. This is about having it on your shelf. Well, the edition, the seven part edition that I have is a little newer. I know some of the episodes aren't exactly the same numbers as they always were. Mm-hmm. It's a little different. So, like, it's mm-hmm. not too bad, but there's a couple that have been switched. So, we will go ahead and start here. So, the Crypt Keeper is hanging out in his lair, and there is a brain yep. on a plate, and it's very squishy. And he's picking up, putting it in a pan because it's the 90s. It, it looks literally <laughs> like those those uh, squishy brain toys you get in the store. Like a stress reliever. Yeah. <laughs> but he's doing the whole brain on drugs thing. Yeah, the d- dank ass memes from, uh, from 1987. <laughs> this is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. And this is your brain after watching Tales from the Crypt. With, like, uh, you know, Partnership for a Drug-Free America, that iconic commercial that is still being made fun of uh, literally over 30 years after it was released. It's amazing. Yeah. Those are 40 years now, I guess. It, it's a long time. Yeah, because I, yeah, I saw this and I was like, ah, the brain on drugs, the 90s. Uh, in grade school, I mean, yeah, they always had, like, the D.A.R.E. program and things like that. I, I used to have a shirt like that, much to my uh, the Dare shirt? shame. And then I grew up and I realized that drugs won't hurt your body that much oh i don't know well it depends on what kind of drugs (laughs) but like you know all drugs right all drugs being the same kind of thing but yeah but i remember it only because i think when i was like eight or nine we just made fun of it that was what it was you know like anytime no no one ever took it seriously anytime you like made eggs in the morning you're like this is your brain on drugs (laughs) so yeah so he brings in the episode and we're getting started here it's at this resort uh, this hotel resort, which I think looks really neat. They're, they're showing this uh, this woman, very pulpy, running uh, on like this comic book cover uh, with a giant werewolf mouth next to her. There is no such scenario yeah, that takes place in this episode. The comic book cover for this really doesn't have anything to do. <laughs> but Dennis Farina, his name is on screen just now. He was also a cousin Abby from Snatch. Oh, okay. So, yeah, that's where I know him from. Yeah, so this opens up the episode where it's like a point of view where like, well, I thought it was funny. Uh, Never mind. It's not. The camera just this, is being weird. This guy bursts into shot in this gray suit. And he's running for his for his life. We don't know what's chasing him yet. Yeah, he's there's, running. There's a storm. There's like a little low key like chanting in the background as well. Like yeah, uh, and the and the color scheme is like changing where you can kind of see the point of view of whatever's chasing we're, him. We're we're in uh, budget predator vision. Um, yeah, well it's it's blue, not red. So yeah, yeah. they couldn't afford red. And he's running and everything through the woods, and this creature is something is chasing him that can see like in blue. He's getting real. This guy who's running is getting all sweaty. He's tiring out. It's late at night in the woods, and so he can't tell where the guy's coming from. He's kind of like stood there, and then from behind, this werewolf jumps out. I mean, obviously, it's like it looks like a Teen Wolf kind of werewolf, and it's kind of gross. He really he he rips his throat open. Yeah, it's a little quick. Like right away, they don't mess around. They do a throat gash and decapitation right away. And then the very next shot is is super <laughs> hilarious he's real excited he's he's no this is like if uh the ape creature from uh, the crate and creep show if he was a mortal combat character he's holding <laughs> he's holding up this guy's uh head with his spine you know speaking of predator again you know same sort of thing yeah so there is spotlighting there is like a big a floodlight lighting right behind him yeah the lighting looks kind of uh kind of bad in this shot actually so the werewolf guy you can tell it's it's a man like he's still got pants and his shirts all ripped open but he killed this mm-hmm. man 
and he th ripped open his throat and pulled his head out. Now he's victoriously raising it, the head and part of the spine, into the air and howling. He's very excited fatality. that he made... Yes, fatality. Finish him. <laughs> and he's very excited. So he made his kill, and that's how the episode opens, which I, I like it because it, it, it doesn't mess around. It starts no, off right it do away. it doesn't mess around. Uh, it kind of... Uh, that is, like, in my opinion, the peak of the episode, however. <laughs> so then it cuts to the resort. The, uh... She, that's the wife, right? Of the woman? Of the no, man? Of the... Of the yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh... Dennis Farina is the concierge of this, uh... Of this hotel. Yeah, he looking like Robert uh, Goulet. He, he's, like, kind of sending off, like, effeminate foppy vibes. Yeah, he's got, like, like, a little sharp suit and a little beauty uh, mark yeah. he drew on some he, makeup. He looks like he'd be a, one of the murder suspects in a, uh, Poirot, uh, story or something. Oh, yeah. Like, he runs the hotel here, and I like the place. It's got a lot of a lot of wood. Yeah, it, it looks like something you might see in Twin Peaks. Yeah, definitely Twin Peaks. Yep, but it's nice. And so they know that something's been attacked. There's a guy that's following Dennis Farina's character who runs the hotel, and is you know they're trying to figure out if they should leave because this creature's been running around killing people. Mm -hmm. Here's Reginald uh, Vell Johnson. It, it was a little hard to recognize him because he's wearing these uh, glasses. He's rocking that look. He looks like yeah, a civil rights leader. He yeah. looks very nice. He's there yeah. with his wife. All the couples, everyone's kind of congregated downstairs, and they're like, oh my gosh, should we leave this hotel? And then Dennis Farina's like, no, you don't have to. And that's when they kind of, they start talking about, like, they go from, like, a wolf attack to a werewolf attack, and nobody yeah, uh, flinches. Nobody. If it's at any comfort at all, the coroner tells me that your husband's death was instant. <laughs> oh, my. My police help with the Sethe. Thank you. Mr. Antoine. Mr. Antoine. Three people have been murdered at your hotel. I would like to know what you are doing about it, what the authorities are doing about it. I am leaving. This is bullshit. Send the kid for my bags. I'm afraid last night's storm has made that impossible. A mudslide is completely blocking the highway. Wait a minute, wait a minute. That means the police can't get in. There is a killer stalking this place. Killer? Is that what you think? What's the matter with you people? Why can't you admit it? It's a wolf. A werewolf. All right, now, people, people, please listen to me. Now, I agree that every bit of evidence leads to only one conclusion, a werewolf. And it's so blasé, it's so matter-of-fact. Yeah, that everyone it's like, takes it so well. It, it, no, it's like, um, it, it's like a lot of Tales from the Crypt episodes, they, like, they're incredibly pulpy, right? They're incredibly, like, filled with characters who are, uh, who are really exaggerated, really, you know, over the top yeah, and stuff. Yeah, sometimes, yeah. But, but it's, like, usually the scenario is something that's, like, you know, either rooted in, like, uh, rooted in our, in our world, like, and a good example of this would probably be Sin Deep. Where, you know, Leah Thompson, you know, right? It's yeah. a very, very pulpy character, very exaggerated, but it, it is a profession that exists in reality, you know, yes. Streetwalker. Yes. And the pawn shop owner she talks to, you know, this is very real, but the, you know, the elements are folklore. Whereas this is like, uh, okay, werewolves exist, and, uh, all hey right. Okay. All right, yeah. Uh, we, we just have to deal with this now. <laughs> yeah, I, do love, I, I still do love this. How, like, nobody flinches when they said werewolf. Everyone's like, oh, okay, cool, werewolf, but then we're still in danger. And <laughs> it's like, okay. Dennis Farina plays Mr. Anton. He owns the hotel. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, so they're all talking about what they need to do. This guy says they can, he can kill him. Mr. Um, Mr. Loki? The, uh... Like, there's a real nerdy dude that's kind of, like, he... Because he's got glasses and a yeah, bow tie. Yeah, uh, that's Charles Fleischer's character. Okay, but he's the one who acts like he's this, like, this genius on this lore. Like, he, he... He's the kind of guy, like, you'd go to to consult. Like, the like the teenagers discover, like, uh, you know, some weird goings on in their town, and they ask their one really nerdy friend. He'd be that guy. <laughs> yeah. You know? So then as everyone's talking, it cuts over to Mr. Loki. Oh, this is, this is a masterful thing right here. Mr. It's Loki is played by... Timothy Dalton, Timothy everybody. Timothy Dalton. Let's give, let's give him a great big hand here. Yes, he's looking very handsome with a drink. This is amazing. They, like, talk about, like, not revealing uh, his identity, the werewolf hunter's identity. And then, like, in the most unsubtle shorthand ever, <laughs> it, like, pans over in this low, dramatic shot. Timothy Dalton is sitting in this nice wood chair drinking some uh some clear drink i guess it's like you know a vodka or something might or be gin yeah, it might gin, be gin. gin and tonic uh, or something oh well considering the bond connection it might be vodka who knows mm. it pans over he's in low light it's it's slightly below him and he goes well done mr antoine <laughs> and you're like uh wow i wonder who the werewolf monster is you guys yeah it's like i wonder, I wonder who, who we should be is. keeping an eye on <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, he's sitting there, and his name, I, I believe, is Mr. Lokai, which yeah. Lokai is tied to the word werewolf. Yeah, I, I actually looked it up. I typed it in to Google, and all I got was this jewelry store. Yeah, I think I did like, too. I think when it's, I, I, I think I know what you, I know what you mean. I like it. Is there's a tied type. To it's tie. It's like, a different spelling of it, but it is like close. Well, it, it's L. Like it starts with L and you know, like lupine. And, well, yeah, you know, and then you got like lycanthropy so. and all that yeah. stuff. Out of from the side of him comes Beverly D'Angelo, and she's looking and, fabulous. And the first, the, the it is so sexually charged. It is yes. ironically more sexually charged and uh, and like flirty than anything Timothy Dalton did in his two Bond movies. <laughs> she comes over to him and she says, "You know, uh, you know what they say about men who uh, do their ice like that." And he's like. Well, they always lick the competition. It's just like nonstop flirting back and forth. And there are a few cues that are dropped here. Yeah, there's some very like, slight cues. Like, I kind of forgot about this episode, so, like, by the end, I was like, something's up, I can't remember what it is. And it, then when it happened, I was like, oh, yeah, it's that's like, right. It's like he's very clearly trying to bed her, uh, but, you know, she drops a few I cues. I feel like she's doing it but... more. She's definitely doing it more. He's almost, like, playing hard to get where it's like, do you want this? Because, like, she's walking around in this black thing with, like, her cleavage kind of out. And yeah, she's, she's like, got a boob window. Yeah, she's got, <laughs> she's got a boob window. She's flirting about how she's going to take a bath. Uh-huh. And then she's all like, you want to come take a bath with me? Don't forget your submarine. But the sun's coming up. Why don't we discuss it over breakfast? I don't do breakfast. Me neither. It's amazing how much we've got in common. Lunch? Nope. Dinner? Nada. Twenty questions naked in the bathtub, say around midnight. Who's back to the faucet? Mine, of course. You just won yourself a prize, groupie. Room 212, around midnight. And don't forget your submarine. I believe that is a reference to, I, I think, the IMDb page. I forget if they mentioned this in this episode. But obviously, the writers were inspired by uh, Dalton's work in the Bond movies. There's no getting around it. There's one scene later on that. Well, is I mean, they're really talking about obvious. his penis, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like that. It's like that scene in Goldeneye where they're flirting back and forth, but uh, which is not a Dalton Bond movie. But digression. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's a reference to his wristwatch, which is a Rolex Submariner. Oh. Which is like, or it could just be you know an egregious sexual reference. I don't know. She disappears until the end of the episode, doesn't yeah. she? Yeah, like, she just takes off. She's like, okay, so bath time, right? Submarine. Bath time. That means penis. P Th that means getting all of the infections, baby. P in the V is what I'm talking about. Okay. And then she just walks away. And he's like, yeah, I'm gonna see about that later. And he's <laughs> still drinking his drink. So then he goes back around. Timothy Dalton character, uh, character goes back around. And he's talking to the waiter guy. The waiter guy kind of delivers his lines somewhat awkwardly. He's a young, clueless-looking yeah. man. Mm -hmm. He's just... He don't know what's happening. He's just trying to work. <laughs> well, the, he, the character or the actor? Let's not probably, assume it. Probably both, oh, man. really. He's just happy to be there, but he can't show it because he's supposed to just be this shy I mean, you're, you're acting alongside Timothy Dalton, who has a decent amount of uh, things he can do. Here's another thing, too. Like, the concierge is over there, and they're just, like, you know, looking at each other, and the concierge <laughs> is sending off freaking, like, kind of gay yes. vibes. Yeah, that like was really random. Way. Mr. Anton's just watching him, and he, like, turns and smells his own flower on his lapel. Like, mm, yeah, hey, I like what I see. It, <laughs> In case that bath time doesn't work out with that woman, you want to come I, see me? I, I didn't think of it that way. Like, if they had leaned into that, that might have made the episode slightly better. So the next morning, he comes in, Timothy Dalton comes into the dining room at this cute little yeah, hotel. I'm imagining Agent Cooper sitting back here with some damn fine coffee. Yeah, this place is, is huge. It's really cool. It's a lot of wood. Mm -hmm. Everything's wood. Everything is wood. Now, everything actually. is wood. Yeah. The food is wood. The, Just everything is wood. The, uh, the the acting from the side characters is wood. <laughs> there are a lot of characters in this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, th th that's the thing, too, is, like, this is supposed to be, like, a mystery plot. But, like, the other characters are nowhere near as fleshed out as Dalton, who is... This is mostly POV story, where, like, it's from Dalton's perspective as he's investigating stuff. But you don't see, like, he fixates on, like, one or two characters. Yeah, and, and like, everyone they're... has just a couple small little bit parts. Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't have an... Uh, this episode is only, like, 23, 22 minutes yeah, it's, long, it's, so it doesn't yeah. have the time to do that they stuff. They don't. Yellow's the longest episode. Yeah. So. Wolfgang Puck is here for some reason. The, is that uh, who that is? Yeah. So he plays it, he, he get... plays a cook in this yeah, as well. he gets pissed off. Good afternoon, Mr. Lokai. Hello, Wolfgang. Now, what's for lunch? We have a wonderful salmon on cord with the dill sauce. 
and we have a quail on baby greens, and I made a special frittata for you with baby vegetables and a hint of fennel. It's delicious. You, uh, got a cheeseburger? A cheeseburger? And, uh, a large iced tea. Wolfgang. Yes, sir. Uh, plenty of ice. Very hot. So, Mr. Loki, who do you think the mysterious werewolf hunter could be? Uh, it seems to me that that is the wrong question. And one might I add that would only be important to a particular person. And who might that be? The werewolf himself. Or herself. Then he says, a cheeseburger. He walks away despondent. Hey, you could do like a deconstructed and there are thing. There are gourmet burgers out there. Yeah. Don't be that way. But quail eggs, have you ever seen like little, they're so cute. I went to like the Whole Foods or Global Food Market mm -hmm. and it's a little pack of 12 and it's literally like half the size of like a half of a carton of eggs. Like they're real oh. tiny. <laughs> I'm just like, look at the tiny little omelets I can make. This Tempted to buy them just to try it. I think they're... You'd have to know how to prepare them, Yeah, probably. I mean, they're, they're probably not rich like duck eggs. Mm. So, I don't know. Reginald Vell Johnson and then that, his the wife, other chick, uh, his Mercedes, wife. Mercedes, I think her, not not the actress's name, but the They have the quite a bit name. of a role, really, in here. And I do kind of like that they're trying to do a mystery thing about it, but really it's like... It's it's like the, the IMDb page compared this to, like, an Agatha Christie story. <sighs> and I'm not feeling it. I mean, it. they there's, only got 23 minutes. There's also. never... there's you, In an Agatha Christie story, you get, like, the care You establish all the characters, their relationships to the victim, their relationships to each other. Yeah. Like, you, this doesn't do that at all. It's, like I said, mostly POV from Dalton's character. And so Mr. Lokai is talking to this couple, and they're talking about the guy who got murdered and things like that. And Because knowing that this is a werewolf, it's someone who's changing. So we mm -hmm. have to figure out who is the person. And, and meanwhile, that well, that geniusy guy in the background is listening. Yeah, he's looking very pensive. Yeah, he's kind of keeping an eye out. You're trying to figure out, like, who is the actual hunter? Like, this is what uh, confused look, look, me a little. Look, see if they have trust here. Figure it out that way. Because <laughs> that's what kind of confused me a little. Because I was like, that guy in the background is almost kind of being like a Van Helsing kind of thing. But then that could have a play, too, a little bit later. Yeah. In some of it. So he's just real... Speaking of gay vibes, okay right here i was watching it and, and i paused several times and i was like okay that's really gay and then i paused and then i unpaused and then i was like okay that's even more gay it's like implied that he knows this character that loki knows yes. carl from before he's like said you're always changing professions now loki is like we'll talk later carl just just you and me but see that could oh, be oh. also <laughs> and, and he says alone and then he like scuppers off right dalton tells uh vel johnson and his wife he's very sensitive like it's playful but at the same time it's really gay see i don't know like, i kind of got that as if like they've known each other from back when maybe like hunting werewolves or whatever uh, like and they've known each other from the past i i guess so i don't know it it, it seems like uh what was i saying gay vibes gay gay vibes <laughs> everything is gay brain. no so then now after this after all that gay vibes he goes upstairs, and he I guess he he's going in to check out Beverly D'Angelo's room. Mm -hmm. Might be looking to see if he can steal, like, the gin out of her cabinet or something. <laughs> so he comes upstairs, and they do a really good pan shot of the piano. And you're mm -hmm. like, that's interesting. And, like, a little foreshadow there. Pans over to the room, and he's kind of just snooping through his stuff. I guess he's been onto her anyway. Mm -hmm. Maybe he thought she's been a werewolf this whole time, I'm assuming looking through her stuff because she like i said she doesn't show up until near the end of the episode so no. it's like i i was sort of suspicious of her there is a twist that isn't quite what i was expecting but it is still pretty predictable yeah he sees uh he sees carl that like he he hears him like say you know some like uh leave me alone there's uh an unseen person following him He's cradling a little leather bag. He's running off into the woods like the guy at the start of, or like walking off rather. Yeah. Into the woods. And, yeah. and Dalton's like, bingo. Yeah, and I love this Dal part too, because he, he's definitely using the James Bond skills he, he has, for all this. You want to talk about James Bond stuff? This scene right here. Yeah. Okay. So Dalton is, uh, is you know, chasing this guy down. Uh, you can't find him. Uh, he's looking around. And then all of a sudden. Walter Gotel's Gotel, I think it's Gotel because he's born in Germany. Mm. Uh, Walter Gotel, Gotel's character like peers out of nowhere, points a gun directly in, at Dalton's cheek, and the gun is actually a Walther PPK. Uh, what does that mean? It's uh, 
it's James Bond's weapon of choice. Ah. This whole this whole scene is a uh, basically like ripped straight from actually like kind of a Roger Moore James Bond movie. Like it reminded me of that scene at the end of Moonraker where the guy is holding up Bond. He's like, and yes, now I will have the pleasure of putting you out of my misery. <laughs> he like pauses and doesn't shoot him for like 15 seconds. And, and like, this is a very Mr. Bond, uh, before I kill you, Mr. Bond yeah. kind of moment. It's, right yeah, now. there's this whole little like, showdown and they're talking. And this is the old dude that... The the older uh, person in the hotel. I don't want to say gentleman because we'll find out later. Is he supposed to be like a Nazi? Uh, oh, well, you just... He is a, he is a Nazi. Yeah, He's a that's Nazi right. war criminal. Which, again, like, ties into the Walther thing. I guess he carried it with him from the war. I don't know. Well, because, like, he wanted to go after him, or he was going after the nerdy guy, and then this guy came out of nowhere, and then... Heard you asking for me at lunch. No, not me. I was looking for a big, sweaty, dumb fuck with a bald head. <laughs> oh, very funny, Smeldas. You just keep yucking it up. Nice back. Goes with the vest. Now, where's Reject? We wouldn't want him to miss the party. Reject won't be coming. No, I suppose he won't. High price to pay. I knew the little ape had something on someone. Yeah, he had a secret, all right. He kept his nose a little too far up the long ass and started sniffing around. Kind of like you. Really? That's funny. I've always considered myself to be more of a leg man. It's kind of like a, a little, um, a little, like, throw the audience off the scent a little bit because he said, too bad I have to shoot you because I would rather tear you limb from limb. It's, like, implying that there's going to be, like, visceral murder involved because, you know, werewolves and stuff. Yeah, this is where it gets totally, like... This is... He kicks the gun out of the old dude's hand and catches it. Yeah, this is to such a James Bond move. And the way he ruthlessly shoots this guy, I forget his name, he shoots him, Walter Gotell's character, in the head. It's just so ruthless. Like, Dalton is smirking as he does yeah. it. Yeah, gosh, like... he's got such a butt chin. He does. He has very distinctive face. Butt chins do not do it for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's the a... only one I can accept is Bruce Campbell's. Oh, what about? Oh, and Mike Rowe. <laughs> so, so you don't like uh, Kirk Douglas's? Uh, no, okay. no, I can't. Right. That's also the only two I can accept. That's, uh, that's fair enough. But he shoots him right into the head, and they show it. Yeah. So this guy, this Nazi dude or whatever, had a bag full of money, mm -hmm. and he got shot directly right into the forehead. I guess he just leaves him out there. Yeah, he just leaves him to <laughs> rot. Uh, uh, Freaking SAS 1945 style. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, sucks to be you, bye. You. <laughs> and you of course he takes the money. Uh, of course, I mean, why not? And so they come back and everyone's talking about it. And I think, I was going to say, I noticed that Reginald Bell Johnson, I was like, Carl Winslow looking smooth in these sunglasses. Yeah. He's out there looking sharp. He is the best dressed man in yes. this episode. And I'm glad because he doesn't always get to look his best right. in certain roles. <laughs> I'm like, good for you. The, they're all they're all terrified it's going to be night again. They're not really, though, because they're all standing out on the patio drinking they were implying that the old guy was the werewolf. Yeah. Yeah, and so I'm like, no, I think they confused werewolf with Nazi. I think that they were like... <laughs> well, that, that's the scene right here where yeah. he had mentioned to the waiter earlier, you know, if any, how, anything, however trivial, if he, this place gets called, if it gets faxed, whatever, you know, tell me. The, guy, the nerdy guy who, in the earlier scene, it's implied that uh, Gotel's character kills him, I guess. Because he has the same bag that he picked up and everything, and we don't see him again. Yeah, so they're but, implying that Gotel is, is the werewolf. Yeah, the, the waiter says to him, like, he says to Dalton's character that he sent ahead, like, a message to people, like, uh, with evidence that this guy was, uh, was a Nazi war criminal. And Dalton freaks out, he grabs the guy, and he's like, what do you mean? And he's like, oh, how could I have been so stupid? And it's like, uh, you know, he thought he was, uh, he thought he was a werewolf, not a Nazi. Yeah. An easy mistake it's, to make. It's I easy mean. to get those words confused. <laughs> werewolf, Nazi. This, I'll tell you, though, this right here, this waiter's looking like a young Val Kilmer. <laughs> yeah, kind of, actually. Yeah. Especially, like, uh, Island of Dr. Moreau. Oh, man. I like that movie. Not a lot of people do. I thought it was fun. It, it, it's something. I mean, come on. Marlon Brando's a hot mess in that movie. It's <laughs> been such a good time. R.I.P. So, yeah, so, yeah, he's holding on to the waiter's clothes, and he's upset. And his eyes are starting to, to get all over the place. He's like, oh my gosh, I was it, wrong. It, it dramatically zooms in on Dalton's face as yeah. he just, like, has the, the, most, the, the most angry... Ang angry pensiveness is something that Dalton is really good at. So now it's nighttime again, so it's the next night. It's a full moon. Of course. It's a full moon. He comes busting he, into Beverly D'Angelo's room. He kicks down the door. Kicks with down Walther, the door. Walther PPK in hand, ready to, ready to shoot somebody. Yes, kicks down the door, comes busting in. 
Ready he's like, that's it. Something. Now he's after her. I guess now he's assuming she's the werewolf. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Okay. Although... You know, there hasn't been much hint of why she would be like... I guess getting into it, like, uh, we're getting very near the uh, point of oh, don't, reveal. Don't blow it yet. Uh, really. yeah, I, won't, I won't blow it yet. <laughs> so, yeah, so he's looking out the window. There's a nice, like, blue oeuvre color the, the, thing, there's aura. There's blue-tinted lighting oeuvre. everywhere. The moon is directly <laughs> behind him. It's in the same shot. Yes. He starts to... He starts feel to feel funny. Cut, yeah. Oh, maybe he drank uh, too many uh, too many vodka martinis. That'll show you they should be made with gin, but whatever. Actually, when he was going to kill Gotel or whatever, there is a line he does where he goes, he goes, it's time to hula. Uh. Was one of, it was his line of attack. I don't know what that's <laughs> supposed to mean. But he... I remember writing it down in my notes here because he's just like, it's time to hula. And then I think that's when he kicks the gun out of his hand and catches uh... it. So he's starting to, to feel kind of ill, and he's transforming. And that's what I like about werewolf movies and things. That when the transformation scenes are done well, it's mm-hmm. great. And I think this one was done pretty well. I, th- I, th- I thought it was. The in-between uh, the in between werewolf form is pretty fun. Yeah. I uh, think it, when it's done where it looks like it's... I mean, sometimes it just looks so painful. He, and... it, you look look at that. You'd hardly like know it was Dalton. Yeah. Like, he totally he, doesn't look like... He looks like, he looks like he's half-elf. <laughs> <laughs> like it's great his feet are coming through his shoes and it's really painful he's bleeding from his fingernails while his finger his claws are coming mm-hmm. through going through so many clothes well, what i don't get <laughs> is he like the opening scene like they figure out that someone is dead in the woods right yes this is why i think that dalton knows he's a werewolf because like his clothes get all ripped and disheveled and messed up and everything like how would you not know i mean like it, he, i think that he i think that he as a werewolf is looking for the werewolf hunter so that he can kill them. I mean, that's one way to think of it. Because, yeah, at first I was uh, like... Unless he's in extreme denial. Well, I was which... like, it could be a couple things. It could be he doesn't know he's a werewolf and he's looking for the werewolf hunter, which is a good good idea. And he just wakes up either with his clothes intact the next day or just <laughs> naked. And because of... <laughs> he has a re- self-regenerating yeah. clothes. That, well, and notice he drinks. Maybe he thinks he gets so blitzed that he wakes up <sighs> naked the next day in the middle I, of nowhere. <laughs> I don't get is, like, it's what is, like, the... the statute of limitations on this werewolf thing because he comes back to the hotel did he murder that guy in the same night or is it the next night it's the next night because it's is a it couple the night nights... immediately after yeah like he was at the in that wooden chair and he's drinking and everybody's talking about what they're gonna do about the werewolf yeah right? so like i was wondering if that was in the same night because if it was in the same night then that wouldn't make any sense but the yeah way... i don't think so i think because uh, you can have a full moon for a couple nights i think yeah so but... like it's every night he would change so he probably thinks like once a month i go on this drunken binge and I wake up naked in the middle that's, of the woods. That's another interpretation, I guess you could Or, about. I kind of like the idea, though, that he knows he's a werewolf, and now he's been looking for the werewolf hunter, and he thinks it's her, which makes more sense, because mm-hmm. what we're going to find out as he's changing, and he's running around, and he's grabbing onto things, Th- and this, he's... This scene gets messed up. Yeah. He's grabbing onto like, things, and he's pushing things off. He's mad. He's turning into the werewolf. I'm surprised he's as composed as he could, but I guess, like, you know, they're like, don't trash the set too much, Timothy. <laughs> And so then he picks up, like, I guess her, like, nightgown or whatever, or sheets. I guess, and he's smelling it. He's, he's sniffing gonna hunt. it. This yeah. is, like, werewolf panty raid. Yeah. Over here. He's like, like, well, maybe now he can tell maybe that she's a werewolf thing. I don't know. So the maid is unfortunately in this room as well, not hearing his screams not, not, of changing. She is very hard of hearing. You give her a break. <laughs> I was like, poor she, maid. She's directly outside the room, and she doesn't... Okay, she's I thought like, she was in the room. She's outside the room? Yeah, she's directly outside the room. But even still, Dalton was making a shitload of noise. Yeah, and so he like, grabs her, and he's, like, biting on her and pulling it, her around. It, it looks like a rape scene. Yeah, it looks like he's... Yeah, he's, it, he's It's like, when I was watching this, her. I was like, is he gonna screw her? Or what is going on here? A you little know? bit of both. I guess this is just, you know, his predatory instinct taken to its logical extreme. And then he throws her... Extreme. Yeah, he throws her into the piano, which is fun. It's, uh, it's very unpleasant. Yeah. He hits her multiple times. Multiple times, and they show it, her smashing, his smashing her face into She's this piano. She's leaving a squishy, uh, squishy lump on the uh, piano keys there. Yeah, so there's, he's smashing her face into these piano keys, and I... Were they making sound? Because I don't think they were. Uh, I don't they think... weren't. Uh, t- I tried listening. It didn't sound like they were making yeah, sound. Yeah, because I think that's right when like... I was like, yeah, because when I saw that, when I heard that, I was like, wait a minute, what's up with this piano? Because I had forgotten the ending. And mm-hmm. I was like, this piano don't really play 
But he didn't really, I don't think, think about it. He was too busy smashing her face. That's in. right. I, I was, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So. so you're like, oh, something's up with this piano. It's not acting right. And so that's when he, okay, yeah, he does hear it. So he's like, that's weird. This piano didn't play a, a C, you know, like I was hoping. Mm-hmm. And so he picks it up and you see that the inside of the piano is a coffin. Mm-hmm. And it's got, you know, the... And the uh, soil from your The soil land. from your people, yes. And yeah. it's got a pillow because she... She is fancy. She needs a pillow because mm-hmm. Beverly D'Angelo is a vampire. She says, like, she says, oh, the shock horror. <laughs> I think it's a fun twist. And then and Dalton, Dalton just, like, turns his back on the coffin and starts howling. Very smart idea. Yeah. And then, bam! Right, right through counter, the chest. Counter-raped, just stabbed through the chest with a silver candlestick. Yes. Twice. And the movement is very, is very penetrative, very phallic. Yes. Um, so. And she, again, looking fabulous. She's in now a red thing with like a red it, dress with it, the boob window. The, it's the same dress she had before, but now she is uh, now she is the crimson matron. <laughs> but she's got like a nice necklace now in it, <laughs> and she like licks the blood off the candlestick like that's right. And then she calls the coffin her tour bus. I think. <laughs> that's like, awesome. Uh, from what I remember, I saw the episode a few days ago. So. But yeah, I really enjoyed. She looked like I said, she looks fabulous because she's a vampire. So she's a vampire and she's after him, which is for Tales from the Crypt. This is not the first time this has happened. There's another episode that is also one of my other. I really enjoy uh, season two, episode eighteen, The Secret, where it's a little boy who he finds out later he is a werewolf and a family of vampires I adopts him. Think I vaguely remember that. Was that in a mansion? Yes. Okay. Then I vaguely remember but that. But the one. tables are turned. He kills them in that one. Ooh. Yeah, so, I, I remember that yeah. episode now. Because there's that fun line where he's like, now I know what I am. He's like, I'm a werewolf and I have an appetite for vampires. And he just like jumps at him and they're like, okay. It's a, a very uh, Shadow over Inn's mouth ending. Yes. <laughs> and so yeah, so now you find out, yeah, like I said, she's a vampire. She's sitting down here while he's dying because he had a candlestick through his chest. And he's turning back to who he was, and she's, like, licking the blood and being all like, that's right. Didn't expect you till midnight, Loopy. Lucky for me, I'm an early riser. <laughs> you Loopies are so easy. You stomp around, sticking your chest out like you haven't got a brain in your head. Uh, maybe it's better that way. <laughs> Is she normally a werewolf killer, or is it just because he's in the way of her? I think she, I think she wouldn't have killed him if he had just stayed in his lane. Yeah, <laughs> I think she's like, you know what? Or, or she might be a, uh, a werewolf hunter because she said like something like, "You lupus are always so easy." Yeah. yeah. And then like she says like, "I think I might take you up on breakfast after all." And then <laughs> yeah. She her fangs and cuts away. So I guess she does then... turn him down for the thing. It still seemed like she was real flirty, but maybe she was just kind of like, "No, I don't want to," but. Uh, or or you could be like she wanted to drain him or something. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> how how healthy is a bit werewolf blood for vampires? We need to. I need to look through my. I don't know because uh, she she does eat him so or I, she drinks his blood so. I, I need to go look through my vampire the masquerade lore as vampire stuff of choice. Uh, yeah, I feel like another thing is maybe he was getting too sloppy and making too much of a mess to where she's like, you know what, you're killing people and it's too much. I, you gotta get out of the way. Yeah, the, you're so gonna give me away. I, I mean, mean, like, the killing of the maid was just the most spiteful, egregious thing because the fact that he opens up the, the piano and he has the wherewithal to figure out, hey, the piano doesn't make noise. Uh, he figures out who she is right before she kills him. He's he's conscious of what he's doing. Yeah, it wasn't a kill. Like, it wasn't like an animal instinct thing. No, he, just, he like, purposefully killed her just for fun. Yeah, so like, like I can see how that could like get in the way of her trying to be discreet. Or you know maybe she does like the taste of werewolf and she figured it yeah, out and was I, like, I cool, so. I'll that's get in possible. on that. Take out of this werewolf. Sounds good. Uh, yeah. So that's the end. Vampire kills the werewolf. Dude, dude, not much going on in this one, kiddies. I mean, it's it's got its moments, but yeah, it's more about the end and then a little bit about the James Bond fighty stuff. The wonderful James Bond fighty stuff and the gay vibes that go nowhere. <laughs> Although the reason I know they're not really gay vibes is because they lampshaded it super, super heavily with like uh, Dalton and, and Delangelo's yeah. character interacting. 
So yeah, that's the end of Werewolf Concerto. It cuts back to the Crypt Keeper. They can do a real nice close-up of his face where you just see all... I love all the muscles that move yeah. in his face. Uh, so his good. split lips. Yes, he's got a split lip. His nose, of course, is missing. He's sitting with with a with a skeleton in a like bride's outfit or a, like a, a a little dress thing a little to, to talk. <laughs> yeah. He tosses her up in the air and he says, uh, "Whenever you're or right before he tosses her up in the air, he's like, whenever you're ready, Isadora." And and it's like, <laughs> uh, okay, it's, uh, you're gonna reference Isadora Duncan? Is that what you're referencing? <laughs> Yeah, she's got like, like a real ma- like a wig on, and then she's like all trying to pose, and then he throws the skeleton up in the air. If, if it was really an Isadora Duncan reference, I guess she should have had a super long scarf on or something. I don't know. She had something pink on. Maybe it was like wrapped around her like body. It was like a tutu. Yeah, but yeah, so the crypt keeper is just throwing out them puns and <laughs> crypt keeper, you're so punny. The best crypt keeper pun is poor Lokai. Thought he was starring in La Boheme. Turned out he was second lead in Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> but yeah, so that's the end of season four, episode 13, Werewolf Concerto. There is some IMDb trivia. It reunites Bond actors Timothy Dalton and Walter Goggle, who played Bond in General Goggle. In General Goggle. Goggle, I don't know. In The Living Daylights from 1987. They shared no scenes in that film due to him being in poor health. Goggle. Here they are, hero and adversary. Dalton's character is not a hero. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> he is in the fact of saving the them of from he, the Nazis. He is a villain protagonist. Look, the Soviets killed lots of Nazis. I don't admire them very much. And then Charles Flesher. Uh, Flesher. Who, Fleischer? Yeah, I, I okay. think it's Flesher. Who did the voice of Roger Rabbit also auditioned for the voice of the Crypt Keeper. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, has, uh, he has a good variety of voices he can do, so he probably could have done it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, there's but, no, but like John Kassir. Kassir is iconic, so you know I'm happy it turned out the way it did. And if he hears this, hi, John. Yeah, hey, John. <laughs> there are also several subtle hints to James Bond in this episode. Timothy Dalton was still James Bond at the time this episode was made, mm-hmm. which is interesting that they could they, get him, I guess. They, uh, they hadn't made, like, uh, the next Bond movie after License to Kill was Goldeneye. He wasn't, like, every time, like, a Bond doesn't do, like, super successfully... Or as, like, you know, as renowned as some things. Like, with um, George Lazenby, he was only in, like, uh, On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Mm. At least I think that's the the scenario that happened with them. <laughs> until, like, Goldeneye came along, and I think that Dalton didn't want to do it, so... Yeah, they said he did resign the role in 94. Yeah. And then his character in this, uh, Lokai, wears a Rolex Submariner, which was his Bond watch of choice and license to kill. Mm-hmm. He also takes a Walther... PPK from Mr. Hertz. Oh, that's that guy's name. Okay, Mr. Hertz. Okay. Bond's gun of choice during the episode. Lokai is good at games as his Bond, as evidenced by the facts, fact he's relaxing on money he won off of Carl. Okay. I, I, I guess so. I mean, we didn't really get to see him with that. We just see him walking around with the money. But Well, okay. and during the showdown between Hertz and, and Lokai, he says that Carl liked to play games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he never he never loses, so yeah. it was a very James Bond line. Yeah, that's the difference between Carl and me. I never lose. <laughs> this echoes Connery's response to Largo and never say never again. Ooh, so much Bond. I guess an in-universe reason for, uh, I mean, the, the, very clearly they gave uh, Mr. Hertz, like, the, the PPK as an homage to James Bond. Yeah. But that was actually a gun that a lot of Nazis did use. Uh, it's actually the gun Hitler killed himself with. So, you know, a little bit of yeah. trivia for that. Learn something new every day. Every single day. <laughs> every day is a blessing. <laughs> So that's the end of the episode. The next episode is season four, episode 14, Curiosity Killed. Steven, thank you for being on here today. It was my pleasure. I hope that I wasn't too grating for your listeners. It was, you were fine. It was was a good time. Everybody, thank you out there for downloading and listening to this episode. If you'd like to leave a review, you can do so on Apple Podcasts or on Facebook. I do appreciate five-star reviews. Do it. Yes, do it. Takes a few minutes, really helps me out. You can also follow the Facebook page. You can follow on Twitter at Gek Podcast. That's at G-E-K Podcast. You can find me on Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, Podbay. I'm all over the place. So, yeah. So, anyway, thanks for listening and have a good one. Take care.